We are live. Well, not live, actually. This is pre-recorded, so uh, we're not live. We aren't taking any questions. If you have any comments, uh, concerns, leave them in the, in the comment section. Um, so we can discuss it on a later sci-fi power-ish. Or podcast. you can leave questions, comments, concerns for the BS Busters, which um, Pinky won't be here for, but uh, he'll be here in spirit. <laughs> yeah. So with that being said, let's get into it. So, um, but before we get any further, uh, Pinky, introduce yourself. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Pinky Dodd from Video Game Facts. And I have no idea what we're going to be discussing for this week's Sci-Fi Power Hour-ish. Well, this is a little bit special because I decided to cross the streams <clears throat> a little bit and ask a few questions. Like, why aren't there a lot of sci-fi-based RPGs? Generally huh. speaking, like most of them tend to be fantasy, like, you know, young boy wakes up and goes on a quest gathering allies to save the world. Probably, I probably blame on Lord of the Rings in <laughs> terms of the West is concerned. Like that just seems kind of weird to me because, you know, sci-fi is such a fertile genre, you know? Right. It, it, it could totally uh, exist. And yet here we are, no sci-fi. It's it's just weird. It's just really really weird. Um, I mean, like the only sci-fi RPG I can think of is the Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic games. I mean, I mean there are uh, sci-fi RPGs. Oh yeah, and, and, oh yeah, and Fantasy Star and Xenoblade Saga. Yeah, but the first few Fantasy Star games were more like it, it's like. It, like it was, it was kind of like a traditional fantasy uh, skin on top of, like reskinned with sci-fi, because you're still wandering around dungeons, fighting monsters, equipping swords. I'm like, that's where I'm kind of like, okay, you're in the future. There's all this wonderful technology, and you're still attacking people with a sword. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I'm like, no. Nah, that's can't. unless if it's a laser. That's unless if it's a laser sword. Even then, because in order to use a laser sword, you have to get in close. Whereas someone has a blaster, they can shoot your ass from a from a from a from a from a distance. So that's just kind of weird to me. Um, that's just my own little personal uh, gripe about it. But you know, it is what it is. So, um, with that being said, <clears throat> I mean, I just. I, it seems odd to me that there's not that many. Like, the only sci-fi RPGs I can think of, um, like, during the age, during the golden age of sci-fi RPGs, which was the, of, of, during RPGs, which was the 8-bit and 16-bit era, like, <clears throat> and pre-8-bit, 16-bit era, like, like, the closest I can think of during the 8-bit era was, uh, <laughs> War War Land, but even that was an RPG, so scratch that. Never, never heard of it. <clears throat> it, it was Japan only. Um, <laughs> yeah, a lot of, a lot of really good games, Japan only. They only had in Japan. Maybe Super Robot Wars, but that originally was just kind of like a, a tactical game. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, oh, what about Famicom Wars? Yeah, oh, wait, Famicom no, Wars is. Well, Famicom Wars is basically uh, military. Well, it's basically the precursor to Advance Wars. Like Advance Wars is a reboot of Famicom Wars, basically. Um, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> hmm. Hmm. I mean, I guess that- in the 16-bit era, you had like Front Mission. Front Mission 2. You had Cyber Knight 1 and 2. Um, um, shit, I forgot. The Enix uh, robot game where you get to create your own robots like Pokemon and like you can create special oh, attacks I, and stuff. Yes, I know. I forgot the name of it too. Yeah, I forgot the name of it, but that was kind of like a sci-fi game. Um, Earthbound, Earthbound's kind of a sci-fi game, even though it has a lot of like. Uh, mm, how can I put this? 
a lot of down to grounded realism, like 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 tent poles, hippies, clan members. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Earth Mountain, you get to take a baseball bat and beat the shit out of clan members. Yeah, they aren't the KKK, but basically they are, except they wear blue instead of white. <laughs> and they worship Pokey instead of uh, Hitler. Um, <laughs> sorry, Porky. Um, yeah, but aside from that, yeah, you get to... <laughs> so next time people say Nintendo's racist, look, you get to beat the shit out of the KKK <laughs> with baseball bats. Which, really, <laughs> any game that lets me beat the shit out of the KKK with a baseball bat is totally worth playing. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, it's uh, it's one of those games. It's just like kind of like up there, you know. Um, I mean, Cyber Knight. I, I think one day I'll do a playthrough of those two games. I have them for uh, I have the original carts, but I don't have a capture card for my SNES or my Famicom. So what I'll do is I'll probably just emulate it um, and do a playthrough of those games because they're 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 really unique for sci-fi RPGs. And I know some people say, what about Star Ocean? Star Ocean is not a sci-fi RPG. They, they model it like that, but really it devolves into sword and sorcery, uh, you know, typical tropes you see in games. Um, Let's see. What about the lack of sci-fi platformers these days? Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, unless it's Mega Man or Gun Vault, Right, but those are pretty much under the double A or indie category. Yeah, they don't do triple A sci fi platformers anymore, or sci fi anything really. I guess the sci fi is harder to. Um, the shooter genre. Yeah, but even then, I mean, most of the really big sci fi games have kind of gone down the shitter, like Halo. In Mass Effect. <laughs> like, basically, if you're a sci-fi game, you're basically on borrowed time because no one's ever going to put your shit on there, um, which kind of sucks. Uh, or your franchise is going to go down the shitter eventually, which also <laughs> kind of sucks. Because, I mean, Halo is not what it used to be. Destiny kind of sucks. Um, basically, they're not very good. Um, what about oh, sci-fi open worlds? Oh wait, Destiny is one, though. In our uh, I don't really uh, consider Destiny to be open world. Like you go to various zones, and the zones have a set size. They aren't like the closest I would think to a sci-fi open world game would be something like Knights, uh, uh, like The Old Republic, from EA. Uh, that's kind of a but even then you're still in a certain size zone I don't I don't really think there are any sci-fi open world games just because of the nature of science fiction it would have to be a huge game like massive and most of those games fail it's like people aren't interested in a science fiction open world game unless maybe the closest you can think of is maybe Star Trek Online but you know and then there's the lack of sci-fi fighting games I mean, you have Guilty Gear and Blaze Blue. Those are basically sci-fi games. And Killer Instinct is a sci-fi game. Mortal Kombat is a sci-fi game. Um, I mean, they exist. They just aren't. Um, it's just easier to do, you know. Mm -hmm. well, what about the new Smash Brothers clone that's supposed that's 100% sci-fi? I mean, that's cool. <clears throat> I mean, I don't know if I'm going to like it, but whatever. Let's see. I had to, I'm thinking of another job. Perhaps a, a sci-fi life simulator simulation game? Yeah, they, they have one of those on the Wii. It was Opuna. It was also an arcade, but it had the life 
aspect because you could eat food. You had to like you had to get a job in order to earn money. Like you can just like you got money for defeating enemies, but that really didn't do much for you. Like you could also get like you become a dancer, you become a fisher, you become a farmer, you could become an artist. Like it was just it was weird. It was it was a really it was one of those good weird games, kind of like Earthbound's weird. Like Opuna was that type of weird. Uh huh. And see, we already got sci-fi horror games. And mm -hmm. uh, see, as well as sci-fi action, sci-fi adventure, sci-fi fantasy. I mean, we had sci-fi adventure in the in the sixth game with like Ratchet and Clank and Jack and Daxter. Especially the second and third games in uh, Jack and Daxter, it turned really heavy, kind of sci-fi, steampunkish. Um, and then like, even Crash Bandicoot was kind of science fiction. Um, but aside from that, there's not a lot of sci-fi games these days, which is kind of sad because science fiction is such a wonderful genre. Um, <clears throat> Oh, because people have gotten sick and tired of the sci-fi element. I kind of wish to prefer the fantasy aspect. Yeah, but fantasy has been around longer as a genre than science fiction. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think there was a resurgence with Game of Thrones, personally. Because um, people just like that shit. I don't know why. Like, Because there's so many other genres that need to be explored, like adventure or, you know other things but it's just always it's always uh fantasy i mean not that i have anything against elves and dwarves and trolls and shit like that but you got to do something different sometimes um i guess the closest marriage between the two would be shadow run perhaps a unique take on a fantasy genre would be adding a kaiju maybe yeah but then you just yeah. then that just basically be dragons fighting people <laughs> Like, a, no, because they already kind of have that with dragons and hydras and, like, the huge monsters in sci-fi. Yeah. But not but not the traditional dragons and hydras. I mean, like, the Godzilla-sized kaijus, like the ones in Pacific Rim. Yeah, but they do have those in, in, in and they do have those in, in, uh, in RPGs. Mm. Yeah, they, they do. They, yeah. There's this thing in um, D&D called the Terra... The Terra Connect. That's basically, it's Godzilla size, except instead of having two eyes, it's got six. But aside from that, it has all the features of Godzilla. It has a, a breath weapon that can destroy. It's basically Godzilla's breath weapon. I mean, it's. I guess fantasy, like if you do science fiction, you have to have critical thinking. You have to create a world that has logic to it. You can't just be like. Well, how come you can do that? Magic! <laughs> like, um... Let's see, I know this genre is recently new, but has there been a sci-fi battle royale game yet? Um... You mean, like, Overwatch? I mean, like, Fortnite. Um... Well, I think Fortnite's pretty sci-fi. I mean, you have these people lifting... Um, dropping into a place and using technology to, to build shit like almost instantaneously getting resources and using a special uh, device to like build houses and platforms and um, stuff that's kind of I think you know or as Arthur C. Clarke says uh Technology, if it's advanced enough, is almost uh, is unable to be differentiated. Like if you were to show a person from five hundred years ago, well, what well, five hundred years ago the fact that that can be Instantaneous change across the world. It'd probably be like, that's magic. 
you know, if you show them a man fly in the space and land on the moon 800 years ago, they'd probably be like, you're a witch. You're a witch. <laughs> <laughs> but we know that we know that's technology. We're like, no, that, that's, 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 you know, that's technology. That's technology. Things that we take for granted now would be considered, you know, heresy years ago. The, what about sci-fi takes on horror, on horror stories like Dracula and Frankenstein? Yeah, they tried to do that. That, uh, that did not work so well. <laughs> Movie wise, um, oh yeah, because any because any X story and X classic story in space don't usually do so well. Dracula in space, which was uh, Dracula two thousand, it sucked. Um, and then they did. Uh, I think the only genre. Oh. The most the only, popular example I can think of is Jason X. Yeah, the only horror genre that kind of works in space is if you're doing like uh, like a, a slasher film, because then it, it becomes a horror game. Like like Alien is a sla- is a, is a, is a slasher, is a slasher film, film. Basically, basically. Um, the original, uh-huh. original uh-huh. Alien, really Scott's right. Alien, is a, is a slasher film in space. Like because basically people are getting picked off one by one by one by this alien that's that's kind of intelligent like it's not like super intelligent but it's kind of intelligent because basically it takes out all these people as the as the story goes on it takes out uh, well first it takes out uh, the the guy who who got face raped by the by the by the face hugger and then <laughs> cuz he dies and then it takes out uh, the, the lady, and then it takes out uh, uh, the black guy, and then it takes out uh, the captain, and then it takes out... Like, basically, it takes out all these people leaving uh, Ellen Ripley, and like she's, she's like, well, fuck this, I'm going to blow up the ship and get in the escape pod, and it manages to get to the escape pod. <laughs> it's like, you ain't leaving me, bitch. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's, <laughs> and she's like, "Damn it!" So she, so she, and she, and she, uh, she, uh, she, uh, she opens the the uh, the airlock and and sucks it in outer space. But even then, there's you know we don't know if that killed the alien. <laughs> Before Ridley Scott destroyed the alien mythos by having a fucking android create the aliens. Um, <laughs> oh, that's what he originally intended because he didn't want to continue with the Xenomorph story but go back like how it was created. You know, I, don't, was- I don't think that was what he originally intended. I think basically Ridley Scott came up and said, look at all these people who have better ideas than me. Fuck it. This is my creation. I'm going to destroy it. Oh, I think that's he was- basically what happened. Because he didn't want to create an alien too, but instead of sequel, a prequel to Alien. Yeah, which is because where it kind of, you know, it kind of fell off the rails. Because I mean, like I said, Ridley Scott had a good idea. Like it, it's kind of like a seed, but I think that, like, I think Aliens is better than Alien. Um, just because it adds, like, you know, whether you like James Cameron or not, his personal views. I think Aliens fleshes out more of the mythos and shows you how formidable like in a way I think Aliens is more horrifying than Alien because Alien like I said it's a slasher film where the alien picks off all the uh, the xenomorph picks off all the members of this crew of the Nostromo and that's cool but in Aliens in Aliens you basically have like uh, you have the, the, the colonial marines like like it's like 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 the entire time you're watching Alien, it's like well, it's a, it's amazing what Ellen Ripley is able to accomplish with no weapons because she doesn't really have any weapons. She just has the shit that she can use, ca- kind of weaponize around the ship. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Whereas in Aliens, you've got people who are trained to kill shit, and they get fucked up. Like all their technology doesn't do. It. They're like, well, we've got motion trackers. They don't work on the on the Xenomorphs. It's like, well, we've got guns and they got acid blood, bitch. <laughs> you know. It's like, you know <laughs> it's like every everything that they think they have they can use to defend themselves against the xenomorphs does not work so much to the fact that they realize that Ripley realizes that the xenomorphs are intelligent because at the end of that film 
And like she goes to rescue the kidnapped Newt, and the alien queen's like, well, yeah, I'll let you go. Sure. <laughs> you know, you came in here, you know, I got some new fresh bodies to cocoon up. Yeah, I'll let you go. Sure, why not? I'm not I won't even I won't even have one of my eggs face rape this little girl. And yet <laughs> she she had to, she had to destroy the queen's eggs, which pissed her off and she chases her ass back. <laughs> you know, it's, which I think is kind of, which I think is kind of cool. <laughs> you know that the aliens are intelligent n- enough to actually have a bargaining system. Where it's like, you know what? I'm gonna give you props because you're you're a female trying to protect your young. I'm a female trying to protect my young. I'll let you go. You know, you know. I'll give you. I'll I'll give you. The, I'll take this L. Let you go. And just Ripley couldn't let it. You know, <laughs> I'm like this. This probably would have been a better film had she just been like, you know what? I, you know what? This is cool. I'm just gonna let people know not to come to this planet. We'll quarantine it. It'll be good. <laughs> this will be alien col- colony from now on. No one, do not come here, please. Jesus, don't. Because <laughs> it's like the base. Um. And we should mention that Aliens was also inspi- inspired the creations of Metroid and Contra. Yeah, Metroid and Contra. And it's, it's, well, I mean, basically, James Cameron says that it was a, uh, it's basically a, a war movie. It's it's like a Vietnam style movie, except it's set in space, where this where this overly cocky crew goes on what they think is just a routine. Oh, we're just going to go and see what's happening over here and maybe rescue some people. And it turns into a shit show because of withheld intelligence because it turns out that the the Wayland yutani spoilers, is uh, trying to get a xenomorph sample and bring it to Earth. Like, like I think, here, here's the problem with Ridley Scott, right? He got mad because other people had good ideas. And rather than incorporate those ideas, he's like, well, I'm just going to destroy it. And I'm like... Like, you're acting like a cranky old man. But he is a cranky old man, <laughs> right? Like, that's basically what he is. So... Kind of like, like, Ka- like how James Cameron now is complaining about superhero movies in which Avengers will stop, will suffer fatigue. Well, I, I think the reason... Here's the difference between uh, James Cameron and uh, Ridley Scott. James Cameron is saying that because he spent too long working on his new... Um, uh, Avatar sequel, Avatar. and basically the only the only redeeming merit of Avatar was that it had wonderful special effects. But we're seeing special effects get so much better than they were back then, even when Avatar came out. That it's like there is literally either this is going to either this movie is going to going to be a spectacular flop or it's going to barely break even because there's no <laughs> way it's gonna it's gonna do that well because Avatar does not have a great story. It's basically Pocahontas in space. With with the uh, with the with with the white savior narrative, you know. Oh, these creatures can't save themselves. But if I become adopted by their tribe and teach them some of the abilities that I learned as the white man, <laughs> they can defeat a greater oppressor. <laughs> you know, some shit like that. Um, <laughs> and you know, oh, I must save him because I love him. He's like he slept with a chick once. Yes, but we're. Together forever. It was just. It. So, as far as we know, the sequel could be much darker and deeper and more complex than the average story from the first one. <sighs> no. Adding more layers to the lore. James Cameron makes good movies, but he doesn't like James. James Cameron has always been a very visual director. He can't tell complex stories. It's just not his thing. Like I like lo- look. He, he look. He tells competent stories. He doesn't tell complex ones. And that's just not, you know, unless they bring a new script writer in to to, 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 to to change it a little bit, like basically how James Cameron did with, a, with, a, with the difference between alien and aliens. I don't see I don't see it jumping like that just because that's not James Cameron's strength. Like, I think the film that he directed that had the deepest story kind of was maybe The Abyss. Um but even then it kind of just everything the story just kind of was uh secondary to the special effects in the abyss and i like the abyss like that's one of my favorite james cameron films but it's still just very like you know it, it's it's it, it, this, everything right. is revolves around the special effects for james cameron and that's where he kind of fails a little bit um in my opinion 
that's you know but I mean it, right. it's, it's still better than Ridley Scott where he's just like yeah because really you know what Alien 3 was originally supposed to be right right well uh, for those of you who, uh, who are listening Alien 3 was originally supposed to be um, it was originally supposed to be like the thing that people had been fighting against in Alien 1 and 2, which was we can't let the alien get back to Earth because basically aliens can multiply at, at a fantastic rate uh, and we can't let these things get back to Earth. Uh, drop content from the first Alien movie was what was what was the xenomorph doing to all those people that it kept on snatching? It wasn't just killing everybody. Uh, and this is something that they've added to the lore, uh, or they added to the lore, where Ridley Scott fucked it all up. Um, and a xenomorph can actually turn someone into a cocoon, which turns someone into another xenomorph. They basically, well, it, it turns them into an egg, basically. Um, right. So that's what it was doing to the members of the crew. So it was basically multiplying itself, even without a queen, which is horrifying. <laughs> Because <laughs> even without a queen, you're fucked. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> so, so I mean, that's basically what was that was content dropped from the first Alien movie, um, and then Aliens Two. Uh, James Cameron adds, okay, well, there's a queen, and she can lay eggs, and these eggs basically have face hugs. Plus, you add in the fact that a single drone, which is what the Xenomorph was in the first Alien, can also cocoon people, turning them into uh, egg cases for face huggers. That is some fucked up shit, man. <laughs> some true body horror. Well, the, thank God they didn't show it in the first film. But in the second film, you think about how quickly a xenomorph infestation can 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 uh, get out of hand. So wouldn't it like Alien Three, like should have been okay? What happens if an alien gets to Earth? We still have not gotten that movie. The closest we got was Alien Five, done by Neil Blomkamp. Um, and it was going to be awesome, but Fox was like, no, we got to go with Ridley Scott so he can fuck up the, he can talk about androids and some shit. I don't know. Like, like Ridley Scott has this hard on for androids because like, he's the one who's like, yeah, D Deckard's a replicant. <laughs> he's like, D Deckard's a replicant. And I'm like, look, the androids are cool and all, but like, like. The, the Deckard being a replicant doesn't even follow the rules of the of the of your own universe. Because <laughs> the whole point about re, about about replicants is that they have a shelf life, like it's like five years or two years or seven years, like they can only be active for so long, and then they just you know they they either they go crazy or they just deactivate because they've lived for too long. So if Deckard is a replicant. And, you know, you watch the next Blade Runner film, like, Deckard's an old-ass man, and he had a kid. Like, I don't know what fucking replicant that is that can live that long and have a kid. A kid. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> but. Yeah. That's just me. That's just me. <clears throat> so. So. I don't know if this is sci-fi related, but I just recently found this one-minute video of this guy showing some kind of cloaking device, and, but the subtitles in Russian, though. Man, it's probably some propaganda. If it's from Russia, it's probably some propaganda. <laughs> oh, and I just rem and I just remembered another genre that doesn't have that much sci-fi. <clears throat> The uh, sci-fi beat 'em up games. You're right. I mean, th those used to be kind of popular in the late '80s, early '90s, and then they came. There was even a, there was even an Alien vs Predator beat 'em up. Yeah, which has never gotten a, a console port. Uh, never, ever, ever. Um, but that is a really good arcade game. I, I got that machine for uh, my second location. Um, that machine, that machine pulls a lot of people in. Heck, even Aliens had its own arcade game. Yeah, it, it was, I think that, I think that was the first person shooter. No, it no, was it, it was it the was one where you're Ellen Ripley and you just pick up weapons and shoot aliens. Like that's the whole thing. Yeah, and you could like you could get power ups. Like you could get the power the power lifter. 
<laughs> Which I'm like, that game would have been so much better if it had like a voice balloon when you get the power lifter where Ellen Ripley's like, let go of her, you bitch. Because <laughs> she says that in the, uh, she says that in the movie. In the movie. <laughs> let go of her, you bitch. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think I think James Cameron is someone who's like, man, uh, this film. I'm, I'm guessing Avatar has gone over budget <laughs> because it's very special effects heavy, and I think basically he's he's panicking. He's like, shit, this movie needs to do really well. <laughs> like, that's what he's and, he, and he was also slamming Wonder Woman for not for not having a complex, a more complex female hero as. Sarah Connor and well, Ripley. Well, it, it does. It, it well, does. Well, well, here's the thing: Sarah Connor and Ellen Ripley are flawed. Right? Like they right. are perfect. They like Wonder Woman is a superhero. She's a she's a she's a paragon. She's a paragon superhero that basically has almost no weaknesses. Well, she doesn't have any weaknesses. It's Wonder Woman, that's her name. Except the original Wonder Woman, who basically, if a man tied her up, that was her kryptonite. No. <laughs> oh God, no. I mean, if you like, if you watch the movie that's based on the guy who essentially created Wonder Woman, he was a, he was a, he was really into S and M, and he was living with two women, and he was like, like he was really into yeah. S and M and doing like kinky shit. Like, so yeah. Like, once you once you re- watch that movie, it's so easy to understand why <laughs> Wonder Woman is the way she is. Um, like for me personally, like I saw the Wonder Woman movie and I was like. Like I, I pers- I don't like that interpretation of Wonder Woman. Um, I don't really like, like I don't particularly like. I think that the movie itself overall is like a C grade movie. But here's the here's the thing: all the other films in the DC extended universe, uh, DC cinematic extended universe, suck. <laughs> so even a like if you've been getting F's and D's, when you get a C plus, that's like you got an A. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? <laughs> to right. you. And that's basically what Wonder Woman is. Um it's it's not a like these people are like, it's one of the greatest movies ever. Yeah, it's okay. It's it's okay. It's really it's okay. But compared to Batman v Superman and Man of Steel and Suicide Squad and Justice League, it's 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 a fucking beacon on a hill, you know, compared to those those turds. Uh, <laughs> and I know some people are gonna get mad. How dare you say that? But it, it is really bad. Um, yeah, I mean, you know. Speaking of people, like I, I think, I think. Uh, speaking of Man of Steel, this is a segue where we get into the second seg- segment, which was, um, like, the rules of remakes and why some remakes suck and other ones are good. I think the, I think the flaw with remakes is that, like, basically, there, there are three rules, okay, that I've come up with for remaking a film, and these can be applied to sci-fi films. Which is perfect because it fits our our uh, the mantra of the podcast, which is the sci-fi power hour ish. Um, like basically, rule number one is if you're gonna make a remake of a movie, make sure the movie that you're remaking wasn't good, because then people aren't gonna be constantly comparing your film to that film. You know what I mean? Right. Like for example, and we can use Man of Steel as, as, as an example. Man of Steel is essentially a remake of Superman one and two from the 70s, from like 78 and, well, just say from the 70s because the two films, Superman 1 and 2 were made concurrently um, <clears throat> with some post work done by Richard Linklater. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, like he reshot half of the movie. Um, but basically, like those two films are widely considered to be some of the best Superman films ever made. You know what I mean? Right. So if you're going to redo, like, you're, I mean, that's kind of, you're kind of, you're stepping into, you're trying to redo something that doesn't need to be redone. Um, and that's where they kind of, that, that's the way they kind of effed up <laughs> a little bit. So, I mean, that was rule number one being violated. A good redo is something like David Cronenberg's The Fly um, or John Carpenter's The Thing. Those two films were done years ago in the 50s, right? Right, but David, but the, the original The Fly, 
like the story is basically the same between the two the two films. Like a scientist for the teleportation device, which he he uses first for uh, you know smaller creatures or like a plant, maybe a dog or something, a kid or something. and then he uses it himself. And the first time he does it, it's successful. Nothing bad happens. The second time he does it. A fly gets into the teleportation device. Now, the transformation of the original fly is much more apparent. Like, he literally, like, the fly escapes. He's got the head of the fly. <laughs> and basically, he wears this, 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 this thing over his head to hide the fact that his head's turned into a fly head. He's trying to do the, like, there's this scene in the first one where he's trying to do the math in order to figure out a way to get out of it and he's like the fly physiology is taking over his his his, his brain and he's literally like you know he's losing he's look he's he's it's like his brain is starting to his brain is starting to uh, shrink or something. Well, his brain's to that of a fly. He, he, the brain's physiology is taking is basically turning his brain into more of a fly's brain. So basically, while he's writing down these things, you can see that his writing is getting shittier and shittier as he tries to figure out the formulas. And I mean, basically, David Cronenberg's The Fly takes that and updates it, but keeps the the, the keeps the original structure in a way that makes sense. Like, you have almost one for one the same themes and uh, the plot points, but it's done in a new way. Like, okay, you have Seth Brundle. Um, in the first movie, it was like the guy was named Anton something. Um, but, like, basically, the same thing happens. A guy creates a teleportation device. Um, he first he starts, he does with uh, plants, then he does animals, then he does uh, himself. The first time he does it, it's not that bad. The second time he does it, gets with the fly, except the transformation in the fly is much slower. Like, because he's slowly becoming uh, Brundlefly, as they call it in the film. <laughs> he's slowly becoming Brundlefly. But just like in the in the original The Fly, like, he's having the, insta the instances where he's trying to, um, like, he has, his, his computer is, like, voice activated. And, like, he, he tries, to, he tries to, to activate it with his voice, but his voice has been changing because he's turning into a fly. Um... And then he's like, like he, uh, like th there's a scene where like he, he's, 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 he's biting on this pencil. He pulls it out of his mouth and his teeth come out of his mouth. Like, it, <laughs> like he's losing his ear. And he's just, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's a lot more graphic in, um, in, yeah. in Cronenberg, but the, the general gist is still there. Except here's the thing. Uh, the original fly had a much more hokier ending where like, like his wife is like, well, you know, if we find if we can find that fly, we can put them back in the thing. And you see outside at the end where like after he couldn't, he just gives up and he has his wife kill him. Um, like he puts his head in a, in a garbage masher in, in, a, in a press. And she's like, look, you got to press my head because it's 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 it, like I can't I can't go on. Um, you see outside where this fly is caught in the spider web and the fly has his head. It's like, help me. Help me! And the spider's about to eat this fly. So either way, it's just not a very, you know, it's not a happy ending. But the second film, I mean, the Cronenberg, you have, um, you know, uh, literally. Um, yeah, both both the original and the remake have sequels. Yeah. And they both involve the same thing. Well, the, the son, son of the fly. fly. Yeah, the son of the fly. I was about to get to that. The son of the fly. Where in the case of, except except in the son of the fly, um, it's like it's not really the guy's son. <laughs> it's it's like some other guy. It's it's kind of, it's one of those things where uh, they did a simple cash in, but it's not nearly as good as the original. Um, oh. Whereas um, the fly two, I think in some ways even better than the first fly because the first fly you had this horrific body horror transformation, um, which is terrifying. In the second fly, you have some of the best creature effects I've ever seen. Um, there's a scene at the end of that film where the guy who uh, Martin Brundle, he's Seth Brundle's son, uh, basically takes into the teleporter with him. And yeah. there's a scene at the end of that movie where that poor bastard is 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 not in the in the greatest of shape. And that's the end of the film. Um, and he's eating slop out of a uh, out of a bowl <laughs> in this pit. Is this fucked up, man? It's a good film. <laughs> I like it. It's a good. 
uh, it's fucked up, but I like it. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically those films were remakes, but they were done well because the original remake was so long ago. Or you look at John Carpenter's The Thing. Like, John Carpenter's The Thing is, like, so much better than the original while keeping the general idea of this creature that comes from outer space and these people have to stop it at this Antarctic outpost. Like, it, well, except in the original, I think it was the Arctic. And in, uh, but in the book that's, that it's based on, it's Antarctic. So John Carpenter's thing was more faithful to the original than, um, than the 1950s version. Yeah. Howard Hughes version. I think it was Howard Hughes. Um, but anyway, yeah, but I mean, you can do a remake if it's done well, uh, you know, and if the Does original that movies that are so bad, it's good, like Planet Nine from Outer Space. Well, I would never make a remake of that because that's just so bad. It's good. But I mean, basically, you have to do a remake of something that sucked or it wasn't quite all the way there. Like they did a remake of The Blob uh, in 86, I want to say 86 or 87. Now, The Blob is considered one of the best sci-fi movies in the original movie. It started young it's Steve McQueen started. as a teenager, <laughs> even though he's in his 30s. <laughs> <laughs> like it is now, they're like, I'm a teenager, dude, motherfucker, you're 35. <laughs> you're a five o'clock shadow. <laughs> and, wow. um, you know, they did, a, they did a remake of The Blob, and it was almost a shot for shot remake. And I personally like it. Um, it didn't do well at the box office, but it's one of my favorite films, mostly because it used to come on HBO all the time when I was a little kid, and I used to watch it a lot. Um, <laughs> but, um, um, but yeah, um, that remake failed because the original Blob is actually pretty good. And a lot of aspects still hold up, like a lot of the scenes and stuff still hold up today so that didn't do too well but then you have this which leads to the second rule of remakes first one is if you're going to do a remake didn't make a remake of a bad movie number two or a movie that didn't reach its full potential number two if you're going to do a remake don't do a paul verhoeven film remake because you're just automatically going to fail because <laughs> i mean let's keep it real okay they did a remake of robocop that sucked they did a remake, a Total Recall, that sucked. And I take it that the third rule is don't let Platinum Duns do a remake because they they did remakes of Chainsaw, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Friday the 13th. Oh, you mean Rob Zombie, right? Just don't let Rob Zombie do a remake of anything. <laughs> That's a, well, no, no, no. That's not rule three. Rule three is... Um, you know, uh, instead of if, if you if you can do a continuation um, in a smart and clever way, it's better to do that than just to reboot it. Um, unless it was a total shit shit. Um, like, but uh, but but rule two was um, basically if you're gonna if don't do Paul Verhoeven remakes because it's always gonna fail. Like t the Total Recall remake sucked. Like it was terrible. It was a piece of shit on a on a on a, on a hot street, um, and it, it 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 had to be because there was no way it was going to be good, you know. <laughs> like because like how they changed Robocop's iconic color scheme with black. Well, no, the film as well as, well as removing all the blood and gore from the original. Well, the reason the reason the RoboCop film failed, in my opinion, wasn't just because it was PG thirteen, but because basically, like, here's here's the secret of Paul Verhoeven. Paul Verhoeven is a satirist. Like RoboCop is a satire of excessive American uh, capitalism and uh, you know Big Brother government society of the eighties. Um. Right, because we were still in the Cold War back then. Yeah. And so basically, if you're going to do a remake of RoboCop, you have to basically do a satire on, you know, uh, culture at the time, which would have been perfect if they had done a satire on, because they started to, like the opening of the film, so they're talking about, yeah, robots being used to pacify the Middle East. And it's like, wow, this would be great if this was a, uh, but here's the difference. The original RoboCop was done by Orion Pictures, 
And the next, the RoboCop reboot was done by Sony, and they made it PG-13. And they're like, we don't want to, we don't want to get stuff on anyone's toes because Sony's a scared ass motherfucker. So, you know, they were like, oh, we can't do that. Not to mention that RoboCop is a household name that they want the family to enjoy as well. Which is somehow. weird because RoboCop, the first film was rated R, and the second film was '90s PG-13, which is basically like just slightly to the left of not quite R. Like, like, like here's the thing. When I was a kid, PG-13, man, is not quite R. Like, Temple of Doom is PG-13. It's not cool. Like, but there's some shit in there that's fucking horrific. And if it was a little bit more graphic, you'd be like, this is an R-rated film. <laughs> like, a man's right. heart gets ripped out. And he's or, the, or the Nazis' faces being melted from the Ark. Yeah, or the Nazis being f- face melted in the Ark, or um, Temple of Doom, uh, or Raiders of the Lost Ark, where a man just, like, uh, fucking melts away. He ages and turns into dust and melts away. That was in the last crusade. Yeah, and the old crusader's like, he chose poorly. <laughs> like, yeah, damn. Or, or, or a man being decapitated. Well, you go in there. And he's, his dad's like, the penitent man. The penitent man. The penitent man. <laughs> the penitent man. <laughs> The Penitent Man. <laughs> that's it. That's just, oh man. The Last Crusade's like my favorite Indiana Jones film. <laughs> and as we notice that Temple, that Kingdom of the Crystal Skull doesn't have its own not quite hard moment. Um, yeah, when, uh, when the aliens, uh, at the very end, when the aliens basically uh, reunite with that one alien that, was, that had the skull and they leave, and the Russian chick um, b- basically melts away. It's basically the Raiders of the Lost Ark moment, but done poorly because that film. That film just. Y- you want to know what hurts about Kingdom of the Crystal Skull? That should have been Indiana Jones's last hurrah, but it was done poorly. Like just bad casting, bad story, bad villain. The only Shia good thing. The, the, the only good thing about that film was that Indiana was that you had Harrison Ford. But everything and and uh, what's her name? Uh, the lady who uh, from the from oh, the, the, the Lost Ark. But literally, literally, like Sheila Buff was like the absolute worst person to put in that fucking movie. Like, like literally, it's like let me find. It, it's kind of like with Spider Man Three, Sam Raimi Spider Man Three, where they got uh, uh, Eric Foreman. <laughs> I know his name's Topher Grace, but in my mind, he'll always be Eric Foreman <laughs> to be to be uh, uh, Eddie Brock. Yeah. I'm like, you're the wrong person for this, bro. <laughs> you're the wrong person to play. Venom. Well, to be fair, Venom was never supposed to be in Spider-Man Three. It was he was being pushed by Sony. Yeah, it was. It was supposed to just be Sandman. Yeah, like it was supposed to just be Sandman and Peter and Parker's then, eternal yeah. bad luck. And then Sony's like, no, 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 you need Venom in this shit. And it was like, fuck, son of a bitch. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, because that's what Sony does. They take something that should, that, like, because the first Spider-Man is not my favorite. It's okay. Um, the second Spider-Man is really good, and then the third Spider-Man just shits the bed because they had to. Pa- they had like three villains in it. They had the Hobgoblin, they had Sandman, and they had um, Venom. And now the Amazing Spider-Man Two suffered the same problem as Spider-Man Three, having three villains they have to juggle around with. One of them not appearing until the very, the very end of the movie. No, there were four villains in there. You had the Rhino, you had um, Harry Osborn and Norman Osborn. I'm gonna count that as one villain. You had Shocker, <laughs> and then you had, uh, well, you generally you had uh, Spider-Man's own crippling guilt, you know. So, I mean, it, it's, it, it's like Sony, it's like, I mean, like, people wonder why Marvel basically had to step in and say, look, you're fucking up our brain. <laughs> We're going to step in and fix this shit. <laughs> like, because Sony kept on messing it up. And, like, I didn't like, like, I did not like the, the first Amazing Spider-Man. I thought the film sucked. Um, because it did. Uh, <laughs> I know some people are going to be like, but I like Andrew Garfield. I'm like, mm-mm, no. 
No, he was a shitty Peter Parker. <laughs> I mean, Tony Pavard did uh, did good as Peter Parker. Who? So not as though so not as good as Spider Man. Who? Um, Tobey Maguire from the Sam Raimi trilogy. Uh, I, you know, I think Tobey Maguire hit the right balance. Except he was an older Peter Parker, but he like graduates high school in the very first, um, in the very first part of the first movie, like in the first arc, in the first act, he's graduating uh, high school. So it's kind of like okay, you're, you have an older Peter Parker. Uh, they wanted to go with an older Peter Parker, which I'm okay with. Like I don't, I don't always need Peter Parker to be like I'm 15 and I was bitten by a radioactive spider. Like, you know. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, right. but I mean, I think Tobey Maguire hit it. I mean, the, the only downside I had right. is that in Spider-Man 3, they had him basically, you know, they're like, well, we need to show him being a dick in, um, you know, for the black, because while he's wearing the black symbiote suit. And I'm like, okay, I get it. Yeah, he, it feeds off the negative emotions. Um, like, literally, I think Spider-Man 3 could have been a great film if it had not had Venom, or if it had had the black symbiote suit, and they don't have Eddie, like, they have someone else, Eddie Brock, but Venom doesn't show up until the very end of Spider-Man goes to the church, and they have the, the bell ring, he, he rips off the suit, right? Like, that would have been the end of that film. And then, you know, from there, the next film would have been, okay, here's your Venom. Here's Spider-Man, a the villain. It's bigger, stronger, faster. And he can't use a spider for his virus. <laughs> like that would have been a great film, Spider the amazing uh, Spider Man, uh, Spider Man Four, but no, Sony's like, no, we need to wrap it up in a trilogy. <laughs> trilogy. Oh, fucking morons. Uh, <laughs> and then they had to make a, they want to make a fourth one with starring Vulture. Yeah, they, yeah, they <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's Sony though. They, if there's a way to fuck something up, they'll find it because it's Sony. That's what they do. Um, but yeah, uh, basically, um, I mean, like, like I said, those are the three rules of remakes. And the third one was, um, you know, if you're gonna, you know, if you can possibly just find a way to not do a reboot or a remake, just kind of keep continue the story. Like, I would rather have a continuation of Evil Dead story than a fucking reboot or a remake of the original. Um, I would rather have more Jason movies. Than just, I mean, and I hate to use Marvel as, as an example, but you notice they haven't, they didn't do a remake of The Incredible Hulk. No. Though, though you could, though The Incredible Hulk was, you can debate it's either a either a sequel to the Ang Lee Hulk or a complete reboot. I'm going to say gonna it's say a continuation. It's a continuation. <laughs> and the reason I say it's a continuation is because, because a lot of the events of Ang Lee's Hulk. Hulk they're referenced and alluded to in um, the Incredible Hulk. With yeah, Andrew but the thing Hulk. is how. But they also showed scenes of how Bruce Banner became the Hulk, based off of the TV show rather than how it actually happened in the Ang Lee version. Yeah, but the Ang Lee version was literally the same as the TV show. Because in the in the in the Incredible Hulk TV show, in the Incredible Hulk TV show, Doctor David Banner, or sorry, Doc, yeah, they they changed it to David Banner in the TV show. Uh, David Banner, uh, basically, he's he's like, trying to find a way to treat cancer, and or something like that. I like, forget it was cancer or something. Using gamma radiation, and he uses he uses like, he uses himself as a test subject. I'm like, why use yourself as a test subject? And then he's he's transformed into the Incredible Hulk. Now um, later on, they they added an extra wrinkle. It turns out Banner was always a mutant because his dad used uh was a was a uh, gamma radiation uh scientist himself he tested himself but it didn't work on him it got his his he got his wife pregnant and the mutation passed on to his kids how's it going just got in after having some pizza well we're almost we're almost up to the one hour yeah we're almost at the end of the sci-fi power hour ish but it's recorded so it doesn't matter <laughs> Um, if you have time, Jewel, we can pre-record the uh, BS Busters early <laughs> after this. <laughs> well, if anything, I wouldn't mind trying to help out if I can. Yeah, because we can we can knock that shit out the way, so then people can have their Mother's Day weekend pre. Uh, <laughs> if you have time. Well, we are, well, for me, we've already celebrated our Mother's Day uh, day early. Yeah, 
Good for you. Well, uh, yesterday. Yeah, but um, <laughs> but anyway, as I was as I was saying, um, yeah, I, I I just I would rather have continuations than just reboots and remakes because, like I said, the original is good enough. Like. I don't need to see Krypton. Like, how many times do I have to see Thomas and Martha Wayne get shot in an alley? Like, <laughs> I mean, if you if you do a story right, you don't need to remake it every few years. I mean, I mean, how, I mean, I don't know about you guys. I'm tired of seeing Uncle Ben get shot, <laughs> and it's like like he's dying in P- Peter's arms. Remember, Peter, Three Spider Man. Great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> Like, hmm. I mean, are you guys tired of that shit too? I'm tired. Of <laughs> I, I'm wondering. I how, mean, Uncle I'm Ben has how long until that. they stop stop using those for a while. I mean, how many times do we have to see Krypton explode? Like, we've seen Krypton explode so many goddamn times. I mean, that's one thing I'll give Superman Returns. I didn't have to see Krypton explode again. Thank God. <laughs> Like, we don't need Superman's origin story again and again and again. Again. He's an alien from outer space whose planet was be- was being destroyed because of uh, changes in its orbit around its red sun. And basically, you know, his dad who's like, well, shit, uh, they, you know, who had all this technology to build a spaceship. But rather than build a spaceship for him, his wife, and his son. Uh, he only built one just ship. His son. <laughs> It's like Kal El. I mean, Jor El. You kind of fucking suck, dude. <laughs> your space design, your space design mechanics are terrible. The comics are better at explaining it. I'm just gonna keep it real. The, the comics explain it a lot better because basically, in the comics, uh, Jor El created. Well, Jor, yeah, Jor El created Brainiac, um, the supercomputer that helps run shit in Metropolis, and basically. Like he, like, like he, he's a brilliant scientist himself, and he's like, wait a second, Th- like the orbit's changing on planet Krypton, and if it changes to this point, we're fucked. And Brainiac's like, no, 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 everything's fine, everything's just fine. <laughs> and he's like, this shit's not, your, your math's not checking out. And so basically, like, uh, and he, like, he goes to the council. He's like, look, this, look, the planet's gonna explode if this shit doesn't. He's like, you can't do this. You're cause a mass panic. Like, at this point, I'm like, man, fuck you guys. I, I want to live. I got a, I got a pregnant wife, motherfucker. I can't be, you know, <laughs> like. <laughs> but we. Uh, so get guys, I, sh- I shared uh, that. I shared that Microsoft article that Mr. Red Fox shared me to one of my Skype friends, and his response was, what a lot don't realize is that the Switch is pure garbage. There is nothing to prevent the Switch from overheating. And I, my response is proof. And right now he's trying to give me evidence to prove that there's no, there isn't a way to prevent the Switch from overheating or something. Uh, I mean, like, here's the thing. Um, if... Like, okay, uh, if, I mean, like, every system can overheat if it's not in a well-ventilated area. Like, if you take your Switch and you wrap it in a blanket <laughs> and, play it, heat. And, and play it while it's hooked up to your TV, uh, you know, with an HDMI cable, yeah, it's, it's going to overheat. If you take your PC and wrap it up in a blanket so that the vents are covered, it's going to overheat. Like basically okay. every system has overheat. I was going to make a joke that okay. somehow right. overheat. Told me that he got it from a. He, got, he, got, he told me he got this information from a YouTuber named Mr. Mario or something. Yeah, well, it, it, thing. it sounds like your friend is an Xbox fanboy, and I'm like, of all of all the people to talk about overheating, this is probably <laughs> someone who bought an Xbox 360, like three or four Xbox 360s, because of the overheating issue. I really think he kind of needs to yep, shut the fuck up. Is, I, I, uh, I know him. Bef- I've known him for a little while now. He's been. He is a. He plays mostly my, Xbox and PC. Well, there you go. Um, <laughs> it figures. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Um, and we'll talk about that in BS Busters, which is <laughs> going to be recorded next, folks. Because <laughs> since I got the crew here, I might as well, you know, um, just so. Um, with that, that's the end of this podcast. I would say just give your uh, your outros. So give your outros, and then we'll start recording <laughs> the next one after this. Cause... 
since you're here, I mean, shit. I yeah, know. I'm. A, and I'll start things off since I'm the one that's late for the party. Say, so, hey, farewell, ladies and gentlemen. This is your Eli Moonstar, the Game of Mage, and it's going to be interesting to see what comes up next. Mm hmm. And this is Pigon from Video Game Facts. Right now, I just posted my last article for today before, before I make my leave for tomorrow. All right. Okay, then. So, and, yeah. so I'm going to be spending the rest of my not, rest of the evening playing the first playing Splatfest round two, Michelangelo versus Donatello. Uh, I'm on Team Mikey. Donnie. Go Mikey, go Mikey, go. Well, I mean, he's 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 the party dude, so I got to go with the party dude. Um, <laughs> but with that being said, and that's the end of this episode. Thank you, and uh, enjoy. Enjoy re drinks responsibly.